One of the very simple things you can do when you're analyzing an audience is look at their basic demographics. This is pretty easy information to get either by just looking at them or knowing the group you're going to be talking to ahead of time, or even just your classmates, and thinking about what type of demographic information you know about them. And how can that be effective and what does that dictate? Well, let's talk about it. So like I said, demographic information is basic level information about your audience. And it deals with some of the general characteristics about your audience and who they are. Now, it's important to note, and when we talk about these demographics, these are generalities. You personally may be very different and you know, might know people that are very different. That's fine, but these are in general what we see based on audience research, whether it's within marketing or speaking or political science or whatever, okay? So you may feel differently and that's fine, but this is a general trend you tend to see. So what are some demographic things that we can look at? Well, big one is age. How old is the audience that you're speaking to? This is important for several reasons. Number one, it's heavily going to influence what topics are going to be relevant to that audience. You know, if you wanted to give a speech informing your audience how to become a streamer and your audience is averages 72 years old, is that something they're probably going to be interested in? I don't know, maybe, but more than likely not. What if they're 19? Maybe so. It's like the example I used in a previous video about social security reform. When you're like in your 20s, you're probably more concerned about other things, you know, college tuition, uh, student loan forgiveness, the job market. You don't got to worry about social security for like 40 something years. Whereas if you're 64, it's going to be relevant. So topic is important. How you explain that topic to the audience is also a big deal. If I want to explain how a nuclear power plant works to a group of, let's say, college students versus a group of kindergartners, probably going to need to explain those in different ways. Because what a kindergartner can grasp versus maybe a 20-year-old college student, different things. So how you explain things, and this goes along also with the examples that you want to use. Basic premise in public speaking and in society in general, examples tend to resonate more with people who experienced them. Okay? If you're going to use an example to illustrate something, if the person was alive and remembers it, it's going to resonate more with them than somebody that just learned it from a book. Prime example. My grandfather, who died several years ago, he was 93, he was a World War II veteran. He was a U.S. Marine who fought in the Pacific Theater. He was a rear gunner and a dauntless dive bomber. It's what he did. Now, I was in the Marines right out of high school. I served in the 1990s. I've seen Saving Private Ryan read about it, but is that going to have nearly as an emo as much emotional resonance with me as it did with him? No. Some of you watching this were probably born after the terrorist attacks on September 11th. You only know about it from video archives and from learning about it. I was alive and watched it live on television. It's going to have more resonance with me than it does with you, and that's normal. So the type of examples you want to use with people to help them understand or to get that emotional connection is going to vary based on that age. It's also going to affect things like the language you need to use. Because if you think about your grandparents, they probably use words or phrases that you'd never be caught dead using. If I can use my granddad for an example again, again, I love my granddad to death. You know, but you know, he was born in the 1920s. I think he was 19 years old when Pearl Harbor happened. To the day he died, and I don't say this to offend anybody, this was just how he talked, but keep that in mind. To the day he died, he would refer to what he thought was an attractive woman as, quote, a hot dish. Seriously. 
Now, I've never used that phrase a day in my life. I think that's a stupid phrase, but that was the vernacular when he was that age. Fun fact, the slang that you tend to use and adopt when you're in your teens and 20s tends to be the slang you use for the majority of your life. You kind of learn it there and you stick with it, right? For me, that was the 80s and 90s. And to this day, I still refer to things as radical or use the phrase tubular. Yeah, I know I'm old. You probably wouldn't say that, different age, okay? So the topic you pick, the examples you use, and the language that you use are all going to need to look at and be dependent upon the age of that group that you're trying to talk to to be the most effective. You're also going to need to look at the gender of the person. Now, I want to be clear. When I talk about gender here, and I probably should change the slide, I'm talking about, you know, men versus women, biological sex, okay? Now, I'm not talking about trans individuals yet because the research on this type of stuff is new. There's, it's being developed, so it's not really out there yet to the point where we have consistent data. But in general, men and women tend to be interested in different stuff. Great example of this is voting behavior. Now, again, you may be different. That's fine. But in general, because political scientists look at things like this, like what types of messages tend to get women to vote for you versus men. And in general, you may be different, but in general, women tend to vote on or can be more easily persuaded to vote on issues of education, civil rights, and the environment. Those tend to be issues that can be hot button issues for them. And a fourth big one for them is crime. Those tend to be issues that they will vote on and you can resonate with them more easily. Men, we tend to vote based on primarily, and you may be different, but again, these are generalities, national security and the economy. We're guys, we're easy. We vote on money and guns, all right? So depending on what your topic is and who your audience is, you may need to approach it a little bit differently. You may need to think about what's going to work for this audience versus this other audience if one's primarily men and one's primarily women. Like I said, I'm not talking about trans simply because the research is new. It's being developed now. It hasn't really been published yet because some, if one study says something, that's not sufficient. You need to get a few that all say the same thing before we can go, okay, that's, we'll kind of treat that as a rule. We're just not there yet. That research is being done. So gender is another one to think about. Third one is religion. Why this one? Well, let me use an example here. Let's say I am giving a speech to a group of self-proclaimed conservative Catholics. I'm not saying they're that. They are identifying themselves as that. Conservative Catholics. That's all I know about them. Well, knowing that is a label they give themselves, what is more than likely their view on gay marriage? What about abortion? What about working moms? Now, I'd be willing to bet when I gave those examples, you probably said, like, oh, oh, they like that. They don't like that. Oh, they're okay. No, they don't like that at all. Why? All you know about them is they're conservative Catholics. Why can you make that? Because religion, if it's very important to people, affects so many other views and things within their life. So it can be a determining factor. You know, if I know this about you, these other things are good guesses. Same thing, sexual orientation. Okay, now it's certainly about, you know, gay and lesbian individuals. Different trans because that research has been done. A lot of it was done in the 90s and 2000s. True or false, are there certain issues and things that tend to be very important to the LGBTQ plus community? Yes. Equal rights and so forth, they tend to be important to them. So if you know that, those are issues that you can look at and talk to them about and use examples like that and that will resonate with them. Same with everything else. What are some other ones? Cultural background. In general, are there issues that tend to be, for example, of higher importance to Hispanic communities versus black communities versus Asian communities versus all white communities? Yeah. I would be willing to bet that things like immigration reform is probably a more hot-button salient issue to Hispanic communities than it is to Asian communities. Not that there's people in that community that don't care, but you probably can just logically think why that would be the way it is. Okay, 
culture, again, is such a big impact on how you see things and understanding that background can really give you some general, and I stress general, broad insight into how they may, may feel about certain things. And another big one you can look at is group membership. And this is an absolute gold mine. All right. If you know you are talking to members of a group, look into what that group does. What are its membership requirements? What does it do as an organization? What are the, you know, what civic, political, whatever causes is it involved in? Those can give you great insight. I'll give you an example. Let's say I am going to give a speech to an audience that they're all members of the American Legion. And if you're not aware, the American Legion is kind of a civic organization. There's a lot of civic you know, work within the community. But it's number one base level do not apply if this is not true requirement is you have to be an honorably discharged veteran of the U.S. Armed Forces. Nobody can be a member of the American Legion if they're not an honorably discharged veteran of the U.S. Armed Forces. That's base requirement number one. So I know if I'm giving to a group a speech to a group of people that are all members of the American Legion, they're all veterans. Knowing that, might that what might be their view on gun control? What about military spending or national defense? Now, if you made any guesses, then you're just based on that group membership. But that can again give you this insight in these other things. And why that's so important is just ask yourself this question. What do you tend to have to do to be a member of a group most of the time? Any guesses? Well, with most groups, you have to give up two things on some level. And these are your time and your money. You have to go to meetings and you have to spend money on dues or equipment or whatever. Now, do we just give our money and time to anything? No, we remember egocentrism. We tend to give it to things, organizations that we care about, that we think are important. So looking at what that organization does, what the membership requirements are, can give you some insight into what they might think about other things. Again, it's not a rule. It's a guideline. It's a broad guideline. There will always be differences, but those can give you some really good information. And demographics, again, these are things that you can get easily. If you're giving a speech to a group, ask beforehand. Like, who am I going to be talking about? Okay, well, what, what are some of the things that your group does? Or look them up online. Or if you're giving, or if you have time, like in a face-to-face -face class, maybe hand out a little survey to the audience a week before the assignment is due just to get some information about them. Again, it's very simple information, but it can give you a lot of information. Marketing companies, for example, literally spend millions of dollars doing just this, just demographic analysis. What does this age group like versus this and combinations of all these various things. So it can really be a very effective tool. So demographic analysis is something that can really keen you into what type of examples and topics and all other kinds of things about how to best approach an audience and what type of arguments or examples will work. So don't disregard it. Yes, they are generalities. And yes, there can and will be some exceptions. This isn't meant to be a hard, you know, hard rule. But it's general guidelines that can typically help you to some extent figure some of this out and help you craft a more effective speech for that audience. As always, I hope you found this video informative and I'll see you in our next one.